Last part, we managed to track the Species 8472 imposter known as Eric Cooper to the Northwest Passage, where he is operating from fluidic space, to attempt to manipulate Admiral Tuvok. By removing the Admiral from the front lines of the Delta Quadrant's exploration, he would be removing one of the most adept and experienced individuals when it comes to countering the Undine. Now we are uniting with the USS Voyager and setting a course for the location of this troublesome spy. This area of space was labeled by Commander Chakotay as the Northwest Passage. It is a corridor of space that the Borg avoid because of the high incidence of quantum singularities, which the Undine use as points of transit. Voyager encountered the passage in 2373, and Captain Janeway chose to use it to travel through Borg space. This precipitated our first contact with Species 8472. We must locate a quantum singularity that will lead us into the correct area of fluidic space. My suspicion is that Cooper is using this region as a staging ground for the massed Undine fleet, and his command bioship will be there as well. Approach each singularity and check its quantum wave signature. When we find the correct one, we will pass through. This Northwest Passage is deep in a web of Borg territory, but as the Admiral points out, we have little to fear from them in this area as it is predominantly patrolled by Species 8472 for the ease of creating their fissures into fluidic space, making this path of a region a spawning ground for bioships. Thirty-seven years ago, the Voyager and the Borg were outgunned by the Undine for the most part, but returning with the future tech and many advanced components to the Federation at the end of their journey, the USS Voyager catapulted Federation technology to the point where a few Starfleet vessels can safely engage a Borg cube, while the Undine have pretty much remained unchanged in their advancement. The Northwest Passage is a reference to the long Canadian Arctic archipelago that at most times of the year is closed off due to the Arctic ice. Many attempts throughout the 14 to 1700s were made to chart a course, but the dangers to either side of icebergs that could sink a ship with merely a scrape made the journey a perilous one, despite its advantages of cutting many miles of current shipping lanes. With climate change, however, the passage is seeing renewed interest as the ice recedes. This won't be our first incursion into fluidic space, but we don't know what lies on the other side of all these fissures. It does seem, however, that these singularities lead to vastly different points of fluidic space, and that while they may be clustered together in our realm, they are light years apart in their home dimension of the Undine. The fact that these crossing points don't line up in any one-to-one -one exact topology is probably how the Undine have been able to cross such vast distances in our realm. The science of crossing over into fluidic space is still one that is poorly understood by the Federation it seems, as both times we have entered fluidic space we have exploited existing singularities, or in the past had the Borg open a portal for us, as they did with the USS Voyager. If I had to guess, the ability to cross over to this domain was one that was also new to Species 8472. At the time of first contact, they had only recently become aware of the existence of our realm. Since then, they've been learning how to direct these portals to other areas and discovering new points where our walls are thinnest, leading to their appearance in the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. We continue to fend off the occasional bioship that attempts to halt our snooping as we probe these openings to see where they lead, looking for one that matches the readings provided to us by the Admiral. It seems that years of continual, let's call it seepage, of fluidic materials into our realm have coloured this region of space with nebulous, 
green and gold. This passage will work. Quickly, we must go through the portal. We need to reach Cooper's command bioship. According to my scans, he is using a modified dreadnought as a control vessel. Intriguing. Cooper's bioship appears to have nerve clusters, gyri, and structures typically associated with brain matter. While most bioships are organic, they are not aware. Rather, they are biological tissue operated by the Undine as tools. Cooper's vessel is different. It is possible that the ship is self-aware. So rather than the pilot being a brain, this might have one all of its own. This would explain the increase in Cooper's telepathic abilities. Not only is his command bioship able to coordinate the entire Undine fleet, acting as a brain for the other ships, but it also amplifies his psionic power. We must gain access to the ship directly. We will need to temporarily disable its shielding mantle so we can fire upon vulnerable sections to disable it. My Federation sensibilities are telling me that firing on this might not be the most moral thing to do. You've come a long way. But as you can see, I am not unprepared for your arrival. <laughs> this command bioship is unique. It is capable of coordinating an entire fleet of bioships. A fleet that will launch from the structures you see here. Even if you attack me, I suspect you will find the sheer power of my new fleet to be overwhelming. I'm finding my earlier reluctance somewhat diminished. So this bioship has been grown with a level of intelligence to it. Other bioships have nerve endings and the like to convey information, but they terminate at control interfaces where the 8472 pilot acts as the mind of the vessel as any of our own ships would. This one seems to have been built rather deliberately to mimic a mind, which makes sense if it's to expand the range of one's telepathy. It is escorted by several Dramaeus class biocruisers, but not much else. I guess the Undine did commit a rather sizeable force to their invasion of Kronos. Perhaps they were relying more on secrecy than outright firepower to defend this place, although according to Cooper we do have an armada waiting for wings. Though it can't be ready yet, or he would have deployed it to try to stop us. Take out the escorts and turn our attention to finding a weakness on the brain craft. Finding what looks to be an aperture shielded by some form of carapace, we disrupt the covering to slowly expose a glowing, fleshy nodule thing. And Rotiva, I'm feeling uncomfortable again. Once exposed, we hit the bioship with everything we've got. Command bioship is weakened. You must beam aboard and locate Cooper while it is possible. So now we're beaming over to this possibly sentient giant bioship crawling with species 8472. We are close to Cooper's position, but the bioship is blocking transport in the area closest to the central nexus. We must find control nodes that will allow us to enter the nexus. As the ship is organic, we may be able to force it open by sending impulses through certain nerve endings, thereby causing a reflex reaction, much like a sneeze. Ah, I'm so glad you went with sneeze and not some... Yeah. Well, thankfully the internal structure of this vessel seems to be made from some sort of bone or cartilage. I was picturing it being slimy. From the numerous hollows and the misty green gases of the ceiling descend the ship's crew. These Undine too seem rather unprepared, despite Cooper's boasting to the contrary. There are few in armour and they're attacking with their natural psionic abilities and melee attacks. I think Cooper was bluffing and in reality 8472 weren't expecting a counter-attack so quickly. Despite his claims, all the evidence would say we caught them with their pants down and their bioship exposed. After we fell the guards, we reach an impasse. The hollows from which the Undine emerged are inaccessible to us and the only door remains clenched. The muscles controlling this passage will not release. 
We will need to find control ganglia we can use to trigger a reflex response and open the door. I'm not tickling the reflex ganglia of a massive brain ship's interior passage, but I guess we have no choice. We can see tendon-like structures that run the rim of this opening, and there are similar structures linked to this console. They must convey impulses to parts of the ship that move, so one of these buttons must open the door. On manipulating the panel, Moore and Dean arrive to again prevent our progress, like white blood cells intercepting an infection. On activating the second panel, the ship relaxes its hold on the locked door, and we move to enter the final chamber. Cooper should be in the chamber just beyond this door. Tuvok, something occurs to me. If this ship is sentient in some way, could we negotiate with it rather than Cooper? An intriguing notion. I shall make the attempt. You must protect me from Cooper and his soldiers while I concentrate on the mind melt. When you are ready, we shall proceed. We enter a cavernous room filled with monitors and lights in organic brackets, a control center of sorts. Cooper stands in human form, ready to oppose us, and as we focus fire on him, more and Dean descend from the inaccessible recesses of the ceiling. We're forced to deal with them as Cooper shields himself and tries to mentally engage with Tuvok, shutting him out of the meld by closing down his interface console. The ship is resisting the meld. I must move to another neural cluster. As the Admiral relocates to another interface and begins the delicate task of connecting his psyche to the mind of the vessel, Cooper tries to intercept our Vulcan friend before we drive him behind another shield. Once more, the Undine enter the room and occupy us as the cycle repeats and Cooper forces Tuvok out of the meld. The ship is resisting the meld. I must move to another neural cluster. You must protect me from Undine attacks while I concentrate. I'm trying, sir, but Cooper is getting really impatient. The final wave of the battle sees Cooper unleash everything he can against us, but our actions serve to buy the Admiral enough time, and he establishes a solid link to the ship's own limited cognition. What is happening? You! You did this! My mind to your mind. Communication Your thoughts. To my thoughts. The weak will perish. Why should we listen to the weak? You will perish when the Iconians complete their purge. To the Iconians, you are weak. We must survive. When we fight one another, we are weak. United, we are strong. No! Don't listen to him! We must see to our needs. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The many must survive. We don't need them. The many will be strong. The strong will survive. They are weak. I will save us. You are weak. What? No! Bio Dreadnought has no intention of entering our space. Now we must return to our ships before the Undine retreat to their own fortresses in fluidic space. The vessel has taken on a softer internal hue of Federation Blue, and the green gases that permeated the chamber have dissipated. I think it's trying to make us feel more comfortable. The ship seemed intelligent, though limited, but Tuvok's simple logical progression from one situation to the next provided it with a clearer picture of the coming struggles. Cooper was so blinded by his bias, and the only source of context this mindship had for reference, that it simply didn't know there was another way. I'm glad we didn't have to destroy it, a unique form of life that it is. We return to the armor during the Voyager, and then back to our normal realm. 
There are no signs of Undine pursuit. Whatever the intent of the remaining Undine forces, it seems that they do not involve our dimension. As a Vulcan, I am not given to personal displays. Nonetheless, we have shared a deep connection. We will always carry a part of this experience with us. In a sense, you have become a portion of my mental defenses. Part of the ship and crew that defined the most challenging aspects of my existence. In the same way, we encountered a Kartra echo of previous people he had melded with. Our shared effort has prevented another Undine invasion, and incidentally allowed me to retain my sanity. Always a plus. Your contributions are appreciated. I must advise Starfleet Command of these developments. I am sure we will speak again. Until then, I am confident that events in the Delta Quadrant are in capable hands. Live long and prosper. Peace and long life, Admiral. With that, the USS Voyager departs. Vulcan mind melds are a strange phenomena that, in an age of science, hints at the existence of something... something other. The Kartra, as it were, seems to be the accumulated knowledge and existence of an individual, but is it merely a series of memories or something deeper? Whatever it is, a mind meld often results in the sustained bond that can be felt even with the passing of light years or decades. But such philosophy is better left to the monks of Pajem. Right now, the telepathic abilities of the Admiral ensured a relatively peaceful outcome. That mine ship, lest we forget, was also housing expansive fleets of bioships tucked away in whatever passes for hangars. They were all networked to the vessel, and at the ship's heart whispering poison in its ear was Cooper. Removing him and establishing a dialogue with the coordinating mind of these vessels, let us finally understand one another, and now free of the corrupting influence of its master, new possibilities and futures open up, and who can say where they'll lead? I wonder what the vessel meant by repurposing Cooper. That sounded disturbingly... clinical. We leave the Northwest Passage and return to hailing range of the Janolan Sphere, and Commander Burgess hears out our report. With Cooper gone, the Undine won't have a leader pushing them toward war with our forces. I wonder why he was so set on this conflict. We still don't know exactly how long Cooper had been replaced by an Undine, or if the original Cooper is still alive. Perhaps this Undine saw something during his time among us that convinced him that the only way to secure the safety of his people was to destroy ours. It wouldn't be the first time that's happened. Remember the Zindi attack on Earth in the 22nd century? They were told by the Sphere Builders that they had to destroy Earth to save themselves. It turned out that Sphere Builders were using the Zindi as a tool in their own destructive plans. We know the Iconians have manipulated the Undine. Maybe they were the ones pushing Cooper to attack. At this point it's speculation, but he is an intelligent agent, and sees the patterns we might not. But it does fit the Iconian MO. For now, the Undine are halted and hopefully some form of truce can be established. Now our next mission is going to be one far more light-hearted as we rendezvous with some long-departed colleagues and Starfleet's most far-flung ambassador. Until then, thanks for watching the fall of Eric Cooper, and I hope you'll be there next time to join us as we explore the Delta Quadrant in the ever-expanding narrative of Star Trek Online. Until the next video, I've been Rick, and goodbye.